Um, I'm Jessica Nancy Black. I direct the Kids Safe and Helpful Foods Project for the Pew Charitable Trust and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And it is with my sincerest apologies that I um, am not your kickoff today, but indeed your send off for those of you that aren't already in your car and gone. Um, we will try to make it worth your time to stay for an extra 40-ish minutes um, as things go. I won't, I won't blather on indefinitely so that if you were thinking you get a few minutes at the end of your time, those can still be available to you. But the goal when, this, when we were going to talk first thing in the morning, and I think still rings true today, is to help people feel somewhat inspired and empowered to put forth a lot of the positive energy and a lot of the conversations and discussions you have here today. So as you were talking about classroom reward solutions and healthy vending options and off-campus lunch issues, that then you know in here it's great because you're talking to people who are on the same page. They showed up. That's a good sign. But when we get outside this world, how do we keep that energy going? How do we keep that motivation going? What might we run into? So that's sort of the big picture as we move forward. I am going to attempt. Ta-da! It worked. So setting the context for this, and this might be a little bit for the choir, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but it will at least give you a sense of how to frame the argument to others if you need to. And I always am happy to make slides available, and you can change them to whatever you want them to be if that's helpful to you, because I know a lot of people then go forth and have to talk to their school, to their wellness council, to their school board, whoever it might be. So please, feel free. Um, as has already likely been discussed, and in not just this meeting, but many, we're in the midst of a pretty severe epidemic, both an obesity epidemic and a food insecurity epidemic. So these two worlds interact in what we sometimes call the obesity hunger paradox, that some of the people in our society who are most at risk for hunger also have the greatest risk of obesity. And so thinking about how we can solve those problems somewhat mutually is really important to our agenda moving forward. For those of you who haven't seen this, and I apologize to all the public health people who have seen it 43,000 times, but just to give a visual for how quickly this problem has increased, I like to run through the CDC slides on this. This is 1990, so I skipped the first 10 years of slides. But starting with 1990, as you can see, most states either had less than 10% of people with obesity or 10 to 14%. Every time you see a new color, that's a new five percentile being added. If we just flip through annually, you start to see that color change. Now there's a new color, right? Because now, oh, new color. Keep going. And that's annual. Every year, that's how fast it's going up. Until we get to where now you'll see Colorado in 2008 was the last state that had 10 to 14%, which you'll remember from the first slide was the high rate of obesity in the country. Get to 2009, 2010, even Colorado's gone. And now we've moved into a completely different color continuum, all the way up to states with greater than 30% of their residents struggling with obesity. So from a disease perspective, from a public health perspective, that is an incredibly fast increase. And something that is no surprise, it's going to take significant effort and culture change to turn around. We don't have a drug for this one. We can't immunize. Whereas that's what we do if it was an infectious disease, right? So we've got to almost think on those immunization levels societally, as a culture. How do we immunize our next generation against this? What is that going to take from an environmental perspective? And if we go in with that attitude of urgency, making some significant changes is, makes a lot more sense than thinking like, eh, that's extraneous, we have other things to think about. So moving forward. Why, why nutrition in schools? Kids eat in all kinds of places. Why are we so focused on what's happening in schools? Yes, families are important. Yes, communities are important. But kids get half of the calories they eat in the day at school. And we now have good research to show, because enough people have made changes over enough time and have done evaluations, that even if we change just that school environment, and we don't manage to change anything else in their environment, it works. We see less weight gain over a three-year period in, in quantitative measures among kids who live in states with stronger standards for the foods that are sold in their schools. So it isn't just because it's a good thing to do, which it is, or because it's educational, which it is, but it's also because this works. If this environment genuinely matters to the kids who are in them. And if we can help fix that environment, not only can we set them on the right track from an education perspective, but it also actually can make a quantitative difference in the nutrition they receive in the course of the day. So 
Another piece of the puzzle, the other side, because often when we're talking the school environment, one of the immediate pieces of pushback is like, listen, we have enough. I have to make sure people's math, test, and math and science and reading scores are up to par. And that's a full-time job, and you're absolutely right. And you know what's going to help? If you have healthy students sitting in those seats. Everybody gets this at test time. Every principal in the country sends a letter home right around test time and says, parents, next week is test week. Please make sure your kid gets a good night's sleep and eats a good breakfast before they come to school, right? Turns out that same good night's sleep and good breakfast is actually really important to them learning the stuff in the first place that they then have to do on the test. So if we actually have kids that are healthier, that are consuming a healthy breakfast on a regular basis, that are consuming healthy lunches, that are maintaining a healthy weight, their attendance is better, their focus is better, their trips to the nurses are fewer, and ultimately their school performance is better. And you know, if you don't believe me, because of course I advocate for these things, and it's my job to tell you that, then listen to other people in the field. So this is Mary Ronan, who's the superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools. Cincinnati is not an outrageously you know, progressive community. We, you know, we're, not, we're not quoting often. Um, we, people pull up you know, examples of things like Boulder, Colorado. And everyone says, yeah, but it's Boulder. Like, come on, right? <laughs> Cincinnati, this is Ohio. This is the heart of the country, people. But they've worked really hard to improve their school nutrition environments, both the meals and the snack food environments, because they're complementary. They have salad bars in every school, they have breakfast in every school, and, and she will stand up and testify and say, we have seen an improvement in our test scores and in our academic performance as a result of these changes. And that is no small thing for a superintendent to say, given everything they're looking at and everything they're held accountable to. So, and lots of other examples like that as well. So, do we have to worry about it in Montana? I mean, come on. Like, yeah, yeah, the rest of the state, the rest of the country. But Montana's a healthy place. People ski, people bike, people walk, people eat natural foods, right? Well, maybe, but somewhere, depending on which population you're looking at and how you do the math, upper 20% of students are still suffering from overweight or obesity. That puts you lower than some states, um, but still close to one in three students struggling with this. But perhaps more worrisome is when we actually look at some of the details. So this is your youth risk behavior surveillance data. The CDC has the youth risk behavior surveillance, YRBS. For short, it's publicly available. Do it on an annual basis to assess what students are doing. It's self-reported data by secondary school students. And they're, they, we're going to go through just a couple questions they're asked, just to give you a sense of, in general, are your high school students healthy? There's the question, right? There's the answer. So, if you look really closely and you do the math, 70% of high school students don't eat one serving of fruit on a daily basis. Just in case that's not worrisome enough, let's look at vegetable intake. 80% don't eat one vegetable a day. One. Anybody want to give me the recommended servings? Yeah. Three to five of each in the most recent dietary guidelines. You're supposed to get nine or more a day. Pretty much we all need to leave here to start eating until bedtime to get all of those in, I realize. But, but none, nonetheless, more than five is usually how we frame it between the two. Less than one, doesn't matter how you're doing the math. That's not okay with like 1970s guidance, let alone what we know in 2014. Whatever year it is. Wow, they changed quickly. Okay. And, and another one, one of the things we know really clearly is that breakfast consumption is closely tied to academics. Like that's one we have good research on, and that's one of the reasons school breakfast can be so important. But in this case, fewer than half of students actually eat breakfast seven days a week, or even six days a week, right? We'll give them a weekend day off with the assumption they're sleeping till noon. Um, but still, we're, we're kind of in dangerous space. So we know we're not necessarily getting the nutrition that kids need. So what are we talking about? We're talking about school nutrition and what needs to change. A lot of this you've already talked about today. So you've already gotten into the details, which is great. We are talking about meals. Standards for meals were updated on a federal basis from the USDA in 2012. The great news is, as of June of this past year, almost all of Montana schools had already applied for their additional six cents reimbursement, indicating most Montana schools are serving healthier meals, which is fantastic. It's not to say there can't still be improvements, because everybody's always trying to make things more interesting, more engaging to the students, but nonetheless, They've done a phenomenal job at sort of raising that bar, which is terrific. But now there's the rest of the environment. 
that those meals often have to compete against things outside the cafeteria at other times of day that are sold from vending machines, from school stores. There's greater variability in this um, from school to school and across the state and across the country. But there are also updated standards that have been released on this arena that schools need to implement by this coming school year. So schools should be in the process of thinking about what are our policies and practices relative to a la carte, snack foods, um, things sold. The, the updated standards on a national level don't apply to what's served. And, and I think Katie talked about that a bit earlier today. So the other thing to think about in the context of all of this is taking a fresh look at sort of the rest of the environment. What, what we're doing in terms of marketing in schools, what we're doing in terms of fundraising in schools that are all sort of part of this educational package that's moving forward. Rewards, I noticed people were talking about kind of all of those other wraparound pieces. Um, <laughs> is this really necessary? Maybe we're, we've already fixed this, right? Maybe we don't have a problem. Well, I don't have Missoula specific data, although you probably do in your head based on the schools that, that you are in. Um, but we know that from a state perspective, only about 27% of schools actually have fruits or vegetables available in places that other snacks are. So when we talk about the thing kids need most, what they really need more of are fruits and vegetables. Yet typically when we're making snack foods available, we're not even making that an option. Hard to expect kids to expand their intake when it's not an option in the mix. So that's just a simple thing to think about. Before we even get into what we take away, it's more of a, gosh, what else could we make available? Um, but about 40% of schools are selling candy of some sort, which is typically by most health standards not considered a health promoting food. Um, and similarly, about 40% still sell soda, sugar sweetened beverages, which from a research perspective is the place we have the strongest data associating sugar sweetened beverage consumption with obesity, which is why it gets so much attention, because it's something that doesn't provide any necessary nutrition and yet provides excess calories that we don't necessarily feel or compensate for in terms of what else we eat. So it tends to be excess for people. Um, so can this be done? So you want me to serve healthy foods in all the venues in which I sell them throughout the day, the cafeteria, the snack bar, the uh, school store, the vending machine, wherever else kids may go, kids won't eat it, we'll lose money, kind of the common arguments that we hear, right? Well, lots of ways to look at this, but the number one way is to say, listen, other people are doing it. There have been literally thousands of schools around the country that have implemented changes and are still functioning. They're doing well. They've got students coming and learning and doing all the things they're supposed to do. And in many cases are doing better. Cincinnati, which I mentioned earlier, has actually seen increased revenue coming in. They're more in the black than they used to be applying healthier standards. So we can learn a lot from those examples that are out there. These are just kind of case in points, but there are examples from every state. There are examples within Montana that are phenomenal examples of change. Um, but do people really want this? Am I going to run into trouble? And when I go talk to policymakers, are they going to be concerned about voter perceptions and whether or not we're kind of getting outside our bounds? Here's the good news on this. This is something parents want a lot. And even non-parents want a lot. People kind of get it. That this concept of I'm keeping kids in school all day, they have to be there. It's, it's an in-local parente kind of environment, right? I'm trusting the school that that is a safe space, that that is a learning space. No, that's a healthy space, just makes sense. So we did a poll a couple of years ago where we asked parents, are you supportive even of national standards? So even taking that on is not as sort of the risk of the local control concerns coming up. 80% of voters, parents and non-parents say, yeah, that makes sense, set a bar. Just raise the floor on this. We still want control locally, which updated national standards allow. So they say, you have to at least meet, meet this standard. You guys can do as much more as you want to beyond that on the local level, on the state level. But you have to at least get here. People are really supportive. And so if we engage parents in this, we tend to actually be more successful if we invite more people in. This also applies sometimes to overcoming the barriers. We invite the community in to help us solve the problem, as opposed to saying, we can't do it because we have this problem. Often they can help be part of the solution. There was a situation recently um, in a school district out west, further west of here, um, that, want, that really needed new kitchen facilities. And they were doing a bond issue in their district to do some other new facility changes, as many school districts do. And they were going to include a fairly significant amount of money for school kitchen improvements. And the people running the bond campaign originally said, we're not really going to talk about that part because I think voters will think it's frivolous and that we won't, that we won't win the bond. Like, they'll vote it down. So the folks, were, it's a nonprofit, put up some money to do some polling in the community and say, you know, if 
a new kitchen facility and kitchen improvements across all the schools such that students could have healthier, more appealing meals was included in the bond with that increase or decrease your likelihood of voting for it. Hugely high numbers, it increased. That they said, yeah, absolutely, like that sounds something worth my money. And in fact, the bond passed with flying colors and their number one sort of marketed reason to vote for the bond, help make foods healthier in our schools. So it's not something we have to hide from. It's something that people really do want, and we just need to bring them into that conversation and help them be part of the solution with us. So this one, and I'm not positive if we'll be able to make it work exactly. Um, I'm going to try doing it from here. But one of the big questions we always get is, yeah, but times are tough, money's tight, can we afford this? And we actually did a health impact assessment looking both at the potential to impact student health in the school food environment, but also what the impact on the district and school financial health would be if we made these major health nutrition changes. And it comes out very clear when you actually do the quantitative assessment of district budgets over time when they change school food standards, that they actually stand to maintain or even increase revenue if, if you're fixing, so to speak, the competitive food environment, that snack food environment, along with the meals. If you compete a healthy meal against not so healthy options, right, cookies and cakes and snacks and candy, the meal loses. But if you improve the rest of the snack food environment, one of two things happen. Either kids buy the healthy snacks, or they tend to buy the meal, which ultimately actually is much better for the children from a balanced nutrition perspective, but also for the school district from a budget perspective. And so that actually didn't make sense to reporters. We talked to them and said, yeah, but how can I sell less food and make more money? And we said, you're not selling less. You're just shifting consumers from one line to a different line where you make more. So what we tried to do in this infographic was to sort of help people to see that. I'll see if I can make it run for you. So there you go. So I send my kid to school with 250 or I put it in their debit account. They go to school, they buy a school meal. From a nutrition perspective, up in the corner, just a sense of what that looks like to give a sense of the pros and cons. Might be a slice of pizza, low-fat milk, an apple, a, vet, a salad, or some other vegetable. It's balanced. It costs two fifty, right? Next thing I do, unbeknownst to me, my kid decides just to shop on a la carte foods. So they get the same slice of pizza, but they get it with fries and some cranberry juice. Just thinking, that looks like food to me. Same two fifty that I sent for my house, but I start to see a very nutrition, a different nutrition picture. Not getting as much of what they need, a little bit more of what they don't need, or. Better yet, my kid just stops at the vending machine. And they decide they'll call lunch, a chocolate bar, some chips, and a sports drink. And spend the same 250, but from a nutrition perspective, actually getting fewer calories. So for the calories, our kids aren't getting enough food. They're actually getting less, but there's almost no nutrition in those calories either um, as we move forward. So from a nutrition perspective, the meal's obviously the best. But what about from a revenue perspective? And here's where the calculator comes in. If if I send my kids to school at 250, USDA contributes another 48 cents between cash reimbursement and commodity food access. The school nets out with 298 for that meal. If, the, if my child shops on a la carte foods, the school gets that 250, but no additional resources. Same types of food. It took labor time, it took shelf time, took everything in the cafeteria, but no additional reimbursement. If my child stops at the vending machine, chances are the school turns around and gives half of that or some portion of that, depending on the contract, back to the vendor, right? So that doesn't always work out in the school's favor. It, it, it is possible, mind you, in any of these cases for things to work, but the budget doesn't play out the way people necessarily expect it to. And what school food service directors will tell you is that the higher their participation rate is, the easier it is to budget, right? That that's, that's the golden ticket. And so making the whole school environment healthy is actually sort of our key to success on that one. All right, so moving on. So how do we change the culture? If people's expectations are that I have to be able to sell these less healthy things to kids, how do I change that? One of my favorite um, questions I got I was presenting the PTA to a national PTA meeting last year and was talking about USDA's updated standards and how they needed to be implemented and the fact that USDA had defined the school day as lasting until 30 minutes after the last bell. And one of the people raised their hand and she said, well then how am I gonna sell the students as they get on the bus? And I said, you're either gonna sell them healthy foods or you're not gonna sell them anything. And she said, well that, that won't work. And I said, it's going to have to. Like that's kind of the point, right? And then, fast, and I thought to myself, 
are they selling as kids get on the bus? Fast forward, I was meeting with a student who lives in my area, not my immediate school district, but in my area recently, and he was saying how you know, they're working on this project to try to get things healthier because their PTA literally stands outside the school buses with pizza boxes. And as kids get on, they sell slices for a dollar as they board the bus. And I thought, and this is to elementary, middle school, I mean, this isn't just high school students who could theoretically, <coughs> so when I'm thinking to myself, I have four kids, four things, all of them. Um, I'm sure they, anyone would love to be adopted, so they'll, they'll let you know about that. But no, but you know, and, and I'm thinking, can, what would I feel like if I came, if, as my kid's getting off the bus, they're wiping the pizza sauce off their face, you know, in third grade. And I'm saying, what did you do? And it's like, oh, this nice lady at school, who's like the mom who lives two blocks away, you know, sold me pizza as I got out of school. It, it just seems kind of odd. But yet, that's the culture in some cases in which we live. And people consider it totally normative. And taking that away seems like we're being overly restrictive, as opposed to stopping and thinking, wait, you're selling something to other people's kids that the kids are excited to buy from you because they weren't going to get it for the kid themselves. Like, what, what does that look like? So just thinking about that, yeah, that shift, and how do we do that? So, one important note is that if we work on policies, district wellness policies and changing that, that work ultimately when done can be impactful because now it's the policy. But also in the process of doing the work, it can be really educational. And if we are inclusive and communicative about that work taking place, a lot of times in the process of doing it and even talking about these things, why are we making these changes? Why are we focused on sugar-sweetened beverages or other things? We're educating families on what needs to be done. There's been an interesting shift that's happened with the recent conversations around, around sort of food standards in different places, in schools, in, in some cases, public spaces and other places. Even when the policies haven't passed, they've noticed behavior change at the consumer level. And a lot of times that tags to the fact that in the process of learning the policy things, it got them thinking. Like, oh, maybe, maybe we do need fewer fill in the blank, right? Maybe we do need fewer sugar-sweetened beverages in our family. Maybe we're doing that too much. Or maybe I should bring something different to class parties. Some research just came out that showed at the state level, if there's guidance, not requirements, but even guidance on things like classroom parties and rewards and those things that can be really tricky politically because people want the opportunity to make those decisions at the local school base. But even guidance saying, like, here's, here's what we probably should be doing. Ultimately, your decision, but here's what would be better. It actually has a major impact on the practices at the, at the school level, because sometimes people haven't thought about it. So, so being out there with these changes taking place is really important. Ultimately, that policy can make a difference. But then the policy isn't the only thing we're trying to make a difference. We're not trying to fix things. We're trying to kind of move people. Identify and share success stories. This stuff is happening. It's happening here in Missoula. It's happening in other places in Montana and neighboring states. There are great examples that are out there, right? that you can actually go to, people you can talk to, who can come talk to you and say, we had that concern too, here's how we dealt with it. Or, yeah, that's a little tricky, but here's how you can overcome that. So make sure we're leaning on those success stories and making sure to raise them up. When we did some polling, looking into kind of what helps people feel more comfortable with these changes, knowing that other people have done it is really high on the list. Like, I want to hear that this is possible and that I'm not doing something that's kind of off an edge here. So making sure that we're leaning on that. And you can find those success stories you know, online at our website, online at the Alliance for Healthier Generation website, the Robert Johnson website, or literally you know, in your community by talking to other people who work in this space, because you all know others who are doing this work too. So the other piece I think is really important is not being too Pollyanna about this. We need to acknowledge this isn't necessarily easy. There are some barriers. How are we going to overcome them? So we conducted a study last year that was nationally representative as well as state representative that looked into the implementation of updated school meal standards and the challenges that schools were facing in that space. The great news was that over 90% of schools indicated, we're going to meet the updated standards. We're going to do this. We can, we will. The other piece of news, though, was that 80% of schools said, or districts, it was the district level, said, but we have some challenges. And some of this stuff is pretty big. And we're using workarounds, we're making it work, but long term, we, we probably need some help here. So our focus as a project is a lot of kind of diving into that and saying, okay, what are those challenges? Those challenges are equipment, their infrastructure, their training, their technical assistance, their access to the right foods at the right price point. How can we make sure those supports are in place or help move forward on those things so they don't bring us down? So it's not saying, look, 90% of people can do this, you can do this, it's, it's fine, it's easy. It's more of a, 
listen, we know it's doable, but there are going to be some challenges, so how do we work together to overcome those challenges? Bring me a problem, let's find the solution, not let's pretend there aren't problems, because ultimately that's not as productive. Um, and then remember that youth are students and teachers in this process. That when we look at major public health changes we've made over time, youth are some of our biggest advocates and allies in some cases. You know, I always tease, try to get in a car with a five-year-old and not wear your seatbelt. Like, it won't last long because they will be the first person to tell you that you've got to get that thing on, right? Or try to start and drive away when you haven't buckled them into their car seat. Not that this has ever happened to me personally. Um, but, and they'll scream, like, I'm not buckled, right? We barely need public health laws when you have five-year-olds in the car. But, but that's because they have been raised in this world where that's the norm, that's the culture. And so the extent we can bring them in, they can be our advocates. They will be our allies at school and at home. As we start out, you know, this is what's normative from them in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade, and second grade, that can continue on. Youth had a major impact on our recycling in this country, on smoking cessation, on lots of things. So, so make sure we're working with them as we move the process forward. It sort of brings us to this kind of question of who do we need to have at the table? And it'd be interesting to think about, you know, if you look back at the list of attendees, like who was at the table? Or what other tables do we need to pull together to get people at the table at our school or in whatever our world is? And I would put youth on that list because if we're doing it to them, that is not going to go nearly as well as if we're doing it with them. And sometimes that means student leaders, representatives, focus groups. It doesn't mean we necessarily make them come to all the conferences, because they may just not consider that the way they want to spend their day. Um, but it also means you know, that, that we might be tying in bigger groups of students. We're keeping them posted on things in a more regular way. Teachers, club leaders, classes, other people who work in this space and who are going to have a really vested interest in where things land. Lots of people can be our champions if they understand what the changes are and if they are invited into the process so they can air the concerns they may have and those things can be worked through. Obviously administrators, school food service directors, school food service staff at the school. You know, I always say I think the woman who works in the lunchroom at our elementary school knows my child nearly as much as I do um, and could probably tell me more about what he's doing on a daily basis than anything. So making sure those people have a voice in the conversation too, sort of your frontline people in terms of what works, what doesn't work, what kids are doing, what they're receptive to, and in recruiting them as sort of marketing change is really important because they are the front line. You know, particularly in elementary school, middle school, they have a pretty major influence in what ultimately gets taken and consumed. Um, and then community members, parents, sort of bringing in that broader audience. And have real conversations. Very often with these issues, we, we, we uh, package them as sort of the stepchild, right? Come to the wellness council meeting, or come to the special meeting where we'll be discussing this, which we need to have in order to get sort of into the weeds. But then we tend to get a pretty, either consistent or small group of people, or both, right? Who we know are interested, who want to be part of this, who have a background in it, who, or who have some special issue they want to make sure gets represented. We also need to take the conversation to folks who didn't necessarily self-identify as wanting to be involved, either because they didn't have time, they didn't even read the newsletter. People are busy, and they have a million other things pulling them. So to the extent we want to make changes, we want to include more people, we also have to make sure those conversations are happening in places where people are. So with youth, you know, classes, meal periods, have focus groups and taste tests and examples and whatever in places that they're in, in passing time, you know, in places that we can capture them more easily. If, if there's back to school nights or conference nights where parents tend to come at the school, those are great opportunities to have a voice for school food service. Yeah, I find it fascinating at, at back to school nights so often how the, the teachers will be there and often the PE teacher will be there, the library and other, other sort of key education people. Cafeteria is closed. It's totally unrepresented. There's no samples of here's what we're serving this year, here's what our menus are. Hi, my name's so-and-so, I'm in charge. I talk to your kid every single day. We don't even meet that person. And often they're not invited into that. From an administrative perspective, those worlds are a little bit separate. So just thinking about that idea of how do we connect parents to this process and get their input um, as we move forward. Club meetings are also really important. So what else is happening around the school? Who else is going to care and have an interest? And how do we invite them to be a part of moving things forward? With staff, getting extra time is really hard. So if there's a way to make time at staff meetings or teacher work days in order to provide the, the training or technical assistance or get the feedback we need, that's always helpful because asking people to do something sort of above and beyond, obviously, is challenging. Um, and then again, the acknowledging barriers, working collaboratively towards solutions, and leaning on those role models and samples of success and lifting them up, inviting them to be part of the conversation and tell their stories 
um, in, in order to help move people forward. Communication, more is better. Two of my favorite quotes from people I've talked to in the past year. Um, one, no one likes change but a wet baby. Um, and two, no one likes surprises unless it's money. So the idea being showing up at school, you know, first day of school in 2014, and every option in the vending machine is completely different than it was last year, not the ideal way to introduce students to change, right? They need to know that's coming. They need to be part of picking those products. They need to be looking at the huge list that human vending has available, all these accessible products, and saying, oh, I would eat that, I would eat that, oh, no. Well, I might eat that then if I tried that. Like, students are, are change averse, so are grown-ups. We always say, like, it's unique to them. It's not, right? It, they, they want to be a part of that process, and they tend to be neophobic. They don't necessarily like new things, and they're fight, adverse to spending money on things that's a risk, as are grown-ups. So buying something at school, either as a meal or a snack or whatever, that I don't know what it is, or I've never tasted it, or I don't know if it's going to be good, is a pretty high barrier. But if I've tasted it, and I know that I like it, or I think I could like it, or at least I know it's better than the other thing I was going to have, then you can move them along. So it's just important. Similarly with parents, the other thing is, you know, we're sending all those kids home as spokespeople, whether we meant to or not. They're going to go home and, and say what happened today. Sometimes that's very accurate. Sometimes not so accurate, right? It's really important that we are communicating with the broader community and everyone about the changes we're making so that they can give their feedback directly and they're not getting fifth hand. Well, I heard that after this and that's happening and they don't allow this and now they're doing this and, you know, what, what, that's not actually true, right? But that's how the rumor mill goes if we're not doing the direct communication. So just thinking about that piece. And then really use social media. It's not expensive. It's pretty easy. It's a little bit of risk. Because often, you know, other people can comment, other people can weigh in, and that makes people nervous. Those of us who are used to very approved communications that have made it through all of our checks and we put it out in the newsletter once a month and it's done. But that's not how people get their news nowadays. They get it from Facebook and Twitter, and they see pictures on Pinterest, and they're looking at those things. So we need to be thinking about how do we feed into those conversations that are happening. If I'm, if I'm rolling out a new menu, and I'm rolling it out on Facebook, then I'm, I'm inviting people to look at that in a whole different way. And, and to engage in that conversation. I can do polling, and I can tweet about what the opportunity of the day is, and those things that often we don't think about in this space, but have been really effective for the, the people working in school health and wellness that have embraced them um, and used them to really grow their audience. That which gets measured gets done. So when we're thinking about the long term, think about what we're putting in place in terms of accountability, evaluation, transparency. Am I continuing to invite people into this conversation? If I'm setting updated policies, what am I doing to see if people are actually implementing those policies? How often am I looking at them to see if they're the ones that work, if we're seeing the outcomes we want to see, if we need to change things? So sometimes it can be as simple as transparency pieces. You know, I will, everything that's, all the foods that are sold in schools will be disclosed, right? That they'll be online and you can pull up a list and say this is everything your kid could possibly buy in the school day. Or, you know, or it could be, you know, if you want to get into some of the, the trickier things, like with rewards, okay, if teachers are going to use food rewards in their classroom, and, you know, one can decide whether they think that's good or bad, they just have to disclose that to parents back to school night. Like, here are the things I offer as rewards in our classroom. Sometimes that's enough to get that conversation started and move things in a different direction, or at least make sure that people are included in that conversation. But things, you know, as far reaching as, can we put goals in our school improvement plans? You know, can we say that by X date, we will have implemented A, B, and C. We have, will have done these things to improve our school health environment so that we're inviting some outside accountability. We're saying to the board, to the state, whoever it is that we sort of want to make that accountability with, this is part of our commitment to move forward as, as we grow. And you can do this. It's not too expensive. People often, that's the first thing everybody worries about. But the reality is both from the research of showing that by increasing student participation in meals, we can compensate for any loss in sort of participation in snack foods. But also, if we're smart about how we're rolling out healthier foods, people have often found that they might see a slight dip if I'm switching, let's say, from sugar-sweetened beverages to water or non-caloric beverages. Often you see a slight dip at first while they acclimate to those new products. But then revenues get pretty close to what they were before. Um, and we're doing the right thing. 
So we've, we've sort of got that piece on our side. There are probably lots of things that are challenging in schools, right? Making sure everybody learns math and science and learns to read isn't easy. But we do it because it's part of the mission, because we need to do it. And we keep thinking of new creative ways to do it, how to better organize it, because we need to get there. And if we think of these things in that bucket, we can figure this out. We can get over anything. Too restricted, there are literally hundreds of foods that will fit within standards that are reasonably healthy. You know, if you use the USDA standards as baseline, there are tons of snack foods that are fruits or vegetables or whole grains or dairy products or proteins that are less than 200 calories, that don't have too much sodium or too much fat or too much sugar, and we can all feel pretty comfortable with our kid having one during the day. <coughs> and that's really all this is. It's just scaling to those things that are going to help kids meet the needs they do have without getting access of what they don't have. And if we think that's you know, impossible, well, I don't have time, I don't have energy, I don't have the people, let's look to those who have done it and like I said, thousands of examples out there and figure out how did they do it. We know it's not actually impossible. And none of those schools are so dramatically unique that I can't do what they did. So, so let's learn from it and figure out how to move it forward. And finally, my favorite um, pushback is always, well, kids won't eat healthy foods. And the answer is, they won't if we don't give them to them, right? Parenting 101 is if I want my child to make a healthy choice, I need to be offering them an array of healthy choices. If I say for lunch, do you want a pear or an apple with your sandwich? They're going to pick a pear or an apple. But if I say, do you want a pear or a cookie with your sandwich? Well, they're going to pick cookie, right? And so will a lot of other people. So why set it up so that we're trying to get them to make tough decisions, to kind of go against the grind across the age spectrum? Why not just set it up so that this one's easy? Every choice you can make is a healthy choice. And by doing that, I will not only be making sure they're actually getting the foods they need, but also setting them on a course in terms of their life and their long-term decision making that does shift their norm. So that choosing among those healthy options becomes normative for them and becomes what they look for in other environments. And if you want more information, please feel free to come to our website at healthyschoolfoodsnow.org, sign up for our action alerts, We'll keep you posted via newsletter and other things as it happens. But also, my personal email is here. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Um, I'm more than happy to get your feedback, hear what's happening. We try to sort of keep in touch with what, where things are moving in the local world and, and also help you get in touch with those people that you need to in order to continue to move forward. So thank you for staying the extra time. I apologize for not being here first thing this morning. And if there's anything else I can do, please don't hesitate to ask. still do off-campus lunch opportunities at high school. And there are a couple of places I think that, that it's worth thinking about intervening on that. Um, one is certainly it, it, it's worth it for districts to be thinking about to the extent they're allowing that, why are we allowing it, and do we want to continue to allow it? In some cases they allow it because they don't have current facilities to accommodate because the high schools have been built or the, the population has grown where they say we have to let people go. That said, there are lots of reasons to close campus even beyond nutrition. Um, in terms of safety and other factors, schools have actually found they do much better with closed campuses. So there's, there's sort of that piece of the policy. But, but to the extent they're open, then one needs to think about what other foods are then accessible to the students outside. But more importantly, think about what we can do internally to attract them to stay. So what a lot of schools that have struggled with that have done is instead of thinking about, oh, this is so hard because they go off campus, and think, why do they go off campus? What is it they're going to eat? And the default often is like, well, then we should offer those things inside, right? We should contract out, and we'll just put up a food court that emulates what they would have driven to. But you can actually be more successful with sort of thinking more creatively and saying like, okay, students like choice. They like different things. So there's a, there's a food service director that 
I've talked to a lot who he has everything in sort of bars. There's the sandwich bar, there's the salad bar, there's the soup bar, there's the chili bar, you know, like there's the your potato bar, and it's all different options and things. He also took the limited resources available and found some extra money and tried to really improve the cafeteria environment so it was a more attractive place to stay. I know high schools that had put in booths, you know, so it looks more like an outside environment. They play music or they have other things going on. Some of it is. Let's think about how we sort of attract them. You know, the food service director in Los Angeles often says that that school meal or schools are the, the single biggest restaurant chain in the country that nobody realizes is. And if we think of ourselves in that frame, like, okay, I'm a restaurant and I have to compete with all those outside restaurants, instead of thinking of it as like I'm gonna lose, think of it as like, no, no, how do I win? Like, pull some people in who are just crazy competitive and see what we can come up with. And granted, budgets and all those things are challenging, but if you can get participation to go up, budget goods go up. So I think that's really the place to focus, is kind of how do you attract them to stay? And then what is that going to take? Yeah? I just wanted to make a comment on that, and I don't know if this is appropriate, but I, worked, I went to high school where there was a culinary arts program, and they, the students managed, they had a, a mm -hmm. faculty supervisor, they ran a restaurant in the school. And the faculty ate at the restaurant. But why not expand that? And in some cases it works. There are some food service directors who do work closely with their culinary um, programs in order to do that. It's actually been an interesting place of discussion because sometimes the culinary programs want exemptions to all the standards because they'll say, but we're learning to cook and we just need more flexibility. And we'll say, how great it would be if you learned to cook healthy foods. Like, you know, as opposed to saying, we, we're going to cook this stuff. That <laughs> and, and so that's the only challenge you sometimes run into is you have to get the culinary programs to embrace this idea of focusing on healthy food production and not just food production in its general form. But other, they can work with the school food service program to be part of the solution. Other questions? Yeah. I have a question on the competitive guidelines, the, the school stores, the vending, and the a la carte lines. Um, there's been some talk about when those changes are coming into effect. And you're saying a hard line change is difficult. So what are your suggestions on using in with that? Is there a time frame component to it? What's the yeah, start now? <laughs> um, so the USDA rolled out their updated standards last June and gave schools a, an entire school year to implement them. Some schools officially, from a federal perspective, the new school year starts July 1. So that's why they did it in June. So it's the 2014-2015 school year in which the updated standards are required for all schools. So the intent of this year was to be the roll-in year. This is the year to be looking into new ideas, to be thinking about how do our current products align with what's going to be aligned? What other things are we going to need to do differently? Where do we need to make changes? Like Now is absolutely the time to be doing that. So that theoretically, by the time we open our doors in the fall, we're, we're not necessarily doing everything at once. We're, we're not making all those changes for the first time, but rather sort of just finishing up all of the changing we've been doing over the past year if that makes sense. So if we haven't started, no worries, we still have six months. Yeah. Well, I, I need to clarify that. Just because I think from USDA, what our understanding is, the final rule is not even out yet for the Smart Snack. And what our understanding is, once it comes out and it starts in the July 1, 2014, schools have a whole year to implement it. So I just know that's what we're Yeah, the interim the final, and I think the, the reality is there's going to be some because flexibility. Because we don't want schools to feel like in the fall, if they don't meet the standards, they get rid of all. I mean, because that's what people felt when the nutrition right. standards went in for school meals in participation. We don't want that with the smart stack. So to answer your question, you know, start working on it now. It's great, but if schools only start working on it in the fall, it's okay. You know, schools will Yeah, I think technically the interim final rule, you know, technically is is <coughs> required as though it were final. That said, there's not there's no change. They aren't thinking it's going to change, but until right. the actual law gets passed, they probably aren't going to finalize the yeah. standards until after implementation starts, so that they can get a better sense of where the hurdles are. Because like with the school meals, like the protein and grain hiccup that happened, part of the challenge with that was the standards are already finalized. Then we implemented, then we identified a major barrier, and it's really hard to tweak a finalized standard. I'm so glad to learn that. Yeah. I didn't know they were going to wait till after. Yeah, so their intent is, and that's why it's actually to all of our advantage, to start moving on this train, because we want to identify where are 
you know, where, where is the little tweaking needed? Are, is, is there the protein grain equivalent in this rule, right? Where it's something that once we start implementing, we think, you don't really need that piece of the puzzle to do this, and yet it's creating sort of added burden. And for those of you that aren't in the weeds on school foods, don't worry about it, it's all fixed. Um, but, but, so yeah, so the thought is make an interim final, which technically means we need to be doing it. That said, there's still a window of opportunity to tweak it, so we won't actually finalize until after the fall, but also we won't be figuring it into accountability necessarily this fall. So it isn't like day one, September, people are coming in to say, are you on track? It's just more like, this is when it's real. So we, we can't wait entirely until it's finalized, because the whole point is to finalize after implementation. But you know, the, we want people to kind of get on that train, if that makes sense, moving forward. And so I think educating them that it's in their interest to get on the train. Right, that right. voluntary compliance feels so much better than. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. And the sooner the better with a lot of, the, I mean, schools that have had the greatest success. And in the survey we did looking, you know, asking schools sort of what have been your barriers or whatever, there's no question that schools who started early in the process were more successful making changes than schools who tried to do it all at once. So I think the sooner people start thinking of where, where, is, where are we sort of okay already and where are we going to face challenges and what do we need to be doing is going to be really important. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know what you felt about the differences in grade level as far as you know, high schoolers, I have high schoolers, and empowering them to make healthy choices versus mandating. I mean, I understand the school lunch program, but other, I mean, the open campus, they'll just leave. Most, I'd say probably 30 to 40 percent of students have vehicles. So how do you I, I, empower them to make a, a yeah. bad choice instead think, of mandating? So the question is how do we empower them to make healthy choices versus mandating it? I think some of it's in our framing, that if I'm actually offering you know, less healthy options and more healthy options in the context of school, there's nothing about that that's, that's empowering them to choose the healthy one, right? That's just saying, I'm kind of setting you up. Like, you can choose healthy, you can not choose healthy. I, go ahead and get the not healthy, and then you don't have to drive anywhere. And I think from an education perspective, we have a bit of a responsibility in that environment that the kids are looking to us to say, you know, what's there? You know, we don't let them opt out of math, right? Like, it doesn't matter if they like it. They still have to take it. And there's sort of this sense of within school, making it's not to say they don't have choices. They should have lots of choices so that they can try different things and find things that work for them. But making all those choices reasonable within that context, typically when we look at long-term impact, has more effect on them choosing healthier things. That I, the other piece of the puzzle we need in there is obviously the education piece. That we can't just put the food out and expect everybody to know why these are healthier options than those are. So making sure that we're including that in other kind of curricular things are important too, but, but I think you know, it's not so much that we're mandating any particular eating in school. It's just more that idea of we're setting them up for success. We're making it so that everything accessible, everything most accessible to them is within reason. And then certainly, any child outside of the school day may be choosing other things. What we do know though is if we do set up that school environment in a more healthy way, and we look at their net intake over the day, kids tend to have healthier diets. So it does tend to have an impact, you know, even if there is eating outside the school day, if, even if it's just the eating in the school day that gets healthier, it does make a difference in the long run. So it's kind of how it plays out. And I guess I was just wondering, how, how does that, your statistics on kids eating healthier in the school day compare to schools who have the open campus lunch where kids are actually leaving? You know, it's an interesting question because I've never seen the data drilled down that specifically to be able to say within those states with healthier standards, if we separate out schools with open campus or versus schools without. So it's an interesting question that's certainly worth thinking about because um, off the top of my head, I can't, I don't know data wise, but to the extent that they do stay there for the day, you know, that I think, I think focusing on how do we make those healthier options more attractive is ultimately going to be the most productive outcome. As, as opposed to kind of saying, oh well, I know you like this better, so I'll serve that. You know, which is, again, kind of what if you think as parents, you know, kids would love for us to serve things that aren't as healthy on, on a regular basis. It's kind of part of our job to raise the bar and say, we're gonna learn to like other things. So, so kind of putting that in the same context, it's, it's how do we do it? How do we make this more appealing and then get it right? Yeah. Um, so you've uh, talked a lot about the importance of nutrition in addition to the implementation of increasing choices. Um, and so have you seen a lot of successes 
of school districts actually um, uh, like institutionalize, institutionalizing an increase in food nutrition education through a school or district wellness committee or something like that, and that actually having an impact on um, health of the community? Yeah, so the question is, in addition to sort of changing the school food environment, have, do we have examples of places where the wellness committee or someone has also institutionalized or put in a policy a, a greater emphasis on nutrition education, those complementary education pieces, such that the total outcome was even better? It's an excellent question. I'm trying to think, you know, anecdotally, I know stories, I, I can't think of a quantitative analysis that's been done, particularly with comparing. You know, some of this research gets tricky because you'd have to find like District A and District B, and they did more ed and they didn't. So, yesterday on the, some of you might know the MMWR, mm -hmm. CDC, that was their announcement. They have that very information for King County and Seattle. Oh, perfect. And compared to all the other districts in the state, King County, the obesity rates went down, the nutrient intake went up, and their Income was stable. Huh. So yeah, it, it was just out. Yesterday. Perfect. Yeah. I was stuck in airport, so I'll have to check it out. But um, <laughs> but that's good to know. So the, it's, the the answer is in case you didn't hear that. That if you look at MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, which is an awful name, but um, it's CDC's publication <laughs> that they that the update just yesterday was on King County's success in Seattle, which is Seattle, Greater Seattle, Washington, um, and and their success tied to the interventions they've done relative to the rest of the state. So there you go. Check it out. I'm going to have to go back to the airport, um, where I'll probably be for the next several days. So if anybody needs me, <laughs> just, just come on out. We'll have dinner. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you all for waiting around, and have a wonderful weekend.